Our theme for 2024 has been Possessing the Land, and this series I call Hot Topics. I've been doing this every summer. I basically, I take requests for what you want to hear about, and last week we began by just taking a whole service to just praise the Lord. That was the first request. First sermon request, no sermon at all. How's that? (laughs) But this week, um, we're going to have a special celebration, which we are calling Spiritual Adoption. So, you all know the Busby family over here? Wave Busbys, yeah. So, Vanessa has been living with Sean and Marissa Busby, and they would like to commemorate her becoming part of their family. So we'll hear a little bit more of the story later. I'm going to give them opportunity to share. But uh, Marissa has been Vanessa's caretaker, guardian for before she was married to Sean. And most recently, Vanessa has said that she would like to be a Busby too. Right, Vanessa? Yeah. <laughs> So because of age and circumstances, it's not really eligible for a legal adoption anymore, but she will go before a judge next month, and she's going to tell the judge that she'd like to change her name to Busby. So we're trying to think, you know, what what do we call this? How do we name this? Well, we thought the term spiritual adoption is a good title for this, because we want to commemorate the spirit of of adoption. That is this, this idea, this feeling of becoming part of a family. Now, Vanessa wants to know that she's part of a family. And that's why we've set aside this special occasion. We're going to have a, a little service at the end. I'm going to keep this short. And we've decided to do a dedication service. You know, the same way we welcome a baby into the family, we want to welcome Vanessa into the family. But first of all, a little word to all of us. <clears throat> Did you know that you were also adopted? I know some of you are like, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> right? We're all adopted into God's family. First of all, God's family started out Jewish. <laughs> and there's not very many of us who are Jewish, right? So we're all adopted into the family. We were also apart from God's family when we didn't know God and we were adopted into his family. God wanted us back. So he made a way that all of us could be part of his family. So here's the first point I have today. We are all adopted. For that, I'd like to go to John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, most of us don't get to choose who's in our family, right? You didn't choose to be born to your parents. They might say that they didn't particularly expect you either. (laughs) But you were a choice. Somewhere along the way, they made a choice that resulted in you being born. They may not have wanted you to be born. You might have felt that. But you need to know that God had a choice in that too. And God had a hand in that. And God decided that you should be here. So regardless of whether anyone planned or whether they didn't, you belong here. All of us belong here. Now when we talk about family relationships, I I just have to acknowledge that family relationships are notoriously messy. Children don't come with an instruction manual, right? Although someone could say, well, there's pretty good instruction right here, okay? You want the closest thing to an instruction manual for how to raise children, it's right here. But most parents, well, when the kids come along, they don't really know what they're doing, especially at first. I think that's why God made grandparents, right? (laughs) 
You know, being a grandparent is kind of like getting a do-over at raising your kids. <laughs> Let's try this again. Um, I think most of us grandparents have decided that we want to be a little bit nicer this time. We would rather be the good guys <laughs> than the bad guys, right? And then there's sibling rivalry. You know, sibling rivalry has been around as long as the Bible. The perfect family does not exist. Do you want proof? Well, the very first family mentioned in the Bible was already messed up. Okay? You had two boys, Cain and Abel, and they were already at each other right out of the starting gate. God's family on earth didn't get off to a very good start. Probably because his heavenly family, when I say heavenly family, you know the Bible refers to spiritual beings as sons of God. So that's his heavenly family. They were already in rebellion against God when the whole story started. So the rebellion of the heavenly family affected the earthly family, spread to the earthly family. But God had a plan to redeem his earthly family from destruction. God decided that he would start a new family, which would consist of both his heavenly family, those that still obey him, and his new earthly family, those who would believe him and follow him. And you know, that's why John begins his gospel right at the beginning saying that God gave us the right to become his children. Jesus came to earth to be the head, the prototype of a new kind of family. And this is not a family based on whose blood you have or who gave birth to you. It's about who you belong to, humanly speaking. It's about belonging to God and therefore becoming part of his family. So that leads us to another point. We all recognize God as our Father. For that, let me take you to Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. So Jesus came and he died for our sin so that we could be reconciled to God. And that atoned for the human part of the rebellion, But in that also, he defeated the dark forces that make up the spiritual part of the rebellion. And that's how God brings us into his family, is through Jesus. Then Jesus also gave his followers the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is how we have a relationship with God through Jesus. Let me take you to John chapter 14, 15 to 17. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, that's capitalized because it's referring to the Holy Spirit. To be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Holy Spirit is just like Jesus, except in you. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, he does what Jesus does, except in you and through you. So one of the first things that the Spirit does in us is teaches us to cry out to God as our Father. When you were born, I know it's hard for some of you to remember that occasion. 
when you were born, how did you know who your parents were? Did somebody say, hello, little one. I will be serving as your constant companion and caregiver for the next several decades or until you decide to leave home. Please read and sign the terms and conditions upon which you will become my child. It's a little more instinctive than that. I remember when my children were born, you know, even though the nurse was holding them, they would turn and look when I spoke because they already knew my voice. You know how they knew my voice? Because I had been talking to them in the womb for months already. I had been telling them, hey, I love you. Praying for them. Saying, I can't wait to meet you. And when they came out, they instinctively knew my voice. And the Holy Spirit does that for us. The Holy Spirit attunes us to the Father's voice. And the Spirit makes us aware of another reality beyond this earthly reality that we belong in God's reality, in spiritual reality. And the Spirit makes us aware of belonging to a family that is beyond our natural human family. Now, I hope your human family resembles a spiritual family. I think a good Christian family should, but that's not a guarantee. Not a guarantee. Our human institutions of marriage and family, well, they're meant to teach us the ways of God. Being in a family, being in a godly marriage is meant to teach us what it means to love and to be loved unconditionally. It's meant to teach us appropriate discipline and the molding of our character. Families are where we learn to give and receive and serve each other in a way that is mutually beneficial. But not all human families do that well. Not all Christian families do that well. But the Holy Spirit joins us to a spiritual family. And, you know, our spiritual family is where we can sometimes learn the lessons that our human family neglected to teach us. And where God can heal the wounds that we received in our earthly families. Psalms speaks about this. Verse, Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6. This is in the Passion Translation. To the fatherless, he is a father. To the widow, he is a father. He is a champion friend. To the lonely, he gives a family. To the prisoners, he leads into prosperity until they sing for joy. This is our God in his holy place. But for rebels, there is heartache and despair. You know, it's nice to know that you're not limited to the resources of your earthly family. And we have Jesus to thank for that. So here's the next point. Jesus made us to be sons and daughters of God. For that, we're going to turn to Galatians 4. I'm going to start with verses 4 to 7, and then we'll continue on a little bit later. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters, as implied, and because you are sons and daughters, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then he continues, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, or implied, or a daughter. And if a son or a daughter, then an heir through God. So you've heard me say this before, Jesus became like us so that we could become like him. He became human, literally born as a baby. He was God in the flesh. Do you know as God in the flesh, he still had to learn to obey his parents, right? And I'm sure he probably made mistakes. You're saying, what? Jesus making mistakes? Well, you know what? Mistakes aren't sinful, 
All of us make mistakes. That's how we learn. That's not sinful. He had siblings, and we know they didn't always get along. (laughs) Especially they didn't seem to understand why he should be out on the hillsides preaching and teaching and ministering to people. But you know, later on, some of them would become his disciples and even founders of the church. You know, in ancient times, being a son or a daughter was not just biological, it was also a status. Now, we know in Jewish tradition they have the bar mitzvahs and the bat mitzvahs. Now, that's a ceremony where a child becomes, well, sort of adult. It's commemorating puberty. They become, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah means a son or a daughter of the law, responsible for their own actions. But then there's another stage of becoming a son, usually by the age of 30, where the son takes on the full responsibility of managing the father's household and all of his business affairs. And that would seem to be the kind of becoming a son that Paul is referring to here because he's making the point that he is also an heir. Now, growing up in his father's household as the heir apparent, he hangs out with the household servants while they teach him about the business. So he's hanging out with the servants. He's among the slaves, but he's not one of them. (laughs) Why? Because he's the son. And they all know that he is going to be their boss one day. And because of it, It's also important that he learns to respect them and what they do because that's how the household gets run, you know. And he needs to understand what it's all about. So we have this picture of Jesus coming to earth and hanging out with the servants, hanging out with the slaves, but he's the son, right? And because he did that, he understands how it is. But here's the crazy part. When he was shown to be the son and the heir of both God's heavenly family and of his earthly families, you know what he did? He adopted us. He caused us to be raised up with him as sons and daughters and heirs right along with him. So that there are no more slaves in God's family. There are only sons and daughters of God. Let me continue with verses 8 and 9. Formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved by those that by nature are not gods. But now you have come to know God, or rather be known by God. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? So here's the point he's making. You're only a slave if you don't know that you've been set free. (laughs) You're only a slave if you don't know you're a son. If you don't know, you're a daughter. Because if you know that you're a son or a daughter of God, you're not going to put up with the oppression of the enemy. You're going to walk with your head up in confidence, saying, you know what? I don't deserve to be treated that way. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. And here's the other thing. When you know that Jesus has made us sons and daughters of God, you don't treat other people like they're slaves either. Why? Say, you know what? Even if that person doesn't know Jesus yet, they still have dignity because of what Jesus did. They may not act like a son or a daughter, but they are a potential son daughter of God. They just don't know it yet. And that brings us to the last point. Because God wants us all 
to be part of his family. I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It says, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. He predestined us to be adopted. Do you know what that means? That means that was his plan all along. That was always his idea. You know, before you were born, God already had a plan and a purpose for your life. He already knew he wanted to adopt you. He already said, they're mine. (laughs) I'm going to make a way for them to come to me. Psalm 139, verses 15 and 16 says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Now that's a euphemism for the womb. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. That's what predestined knew means. He knew it even before it happened. Now, I don't have the benefit of foreknowledge, but Carrie and I do know that we are expecting our first grandchild. This is baby Kolb right here. We call him Muffin or her Muffin. We don't know yet. <laughs> we don't know if it's a he or a she, but I can tell you I love that child. Even now, I haven't even met them yet. I have great hopes and dreams for this child's life. Not even born yet. (laughs) We have the benefit of ultrasound now. We didn't used to have that. But do you think God cares about us any less? No, he cares about us even more. And God couldn't wait to welcome you into his family. Okay, maybe the family you came into wasn't exactly God's family, but I hope they were at least a good family. And even if they weren't a really good family, you know, God had a plan to redeem you. He sent Jesus to become like you so that you could become like him. To lead you out of slavery to sin and Satan and show you what it means to be a daughter or a son of the Most High God. You're adopted. Chosen by God carefully to represent him as a member of his family. And you know what? Even more than that, you are an heir. The Bible says, meaning everything that's his is yours. Certainly everything you need to carry out the assignment that he gives you. And if you don't get anything else, I just want you to know how much you are loved and cherished by God. And then look around you. You have a spiritual family. Yes, I know, some of us are a little bit odd, but we are one big happy family, right? Okay, so we're not always happy. We have our struggles like any other family, but we are still a family, right? And there is a place of belonging that is more than just flesh and blood. It's spiritual. We're a spiritual family. We don't all look the same, But we have the same DNA in that we have the same spirit. And we are bound by blood, the blood of Jesus. We're part of his spiritual body, which is also his physical body in the earth. At least right now, we are his body on this earth. But one day we are going to be united with him and with each other in a much more permanent way. And that just makes me give the old song, 
I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. I'm a part of the family, the family of God. I know that was too low. I made it anyway. Yeah. We're part of the family of God. 